other ATS EVS 533 students, we're on to lecture th D, the fourth lecture of module three, and we're going to continue today talking about what models are telling us about the near-term future. Remember, near-term future was the term that we were sort of defining that meant something like between now and the middle of the 21st century or something like that. Um, dates that most of us, I think, plan to make it to, you know, I mean, we were hoping to still be around at that time. We'll talk about the distant future later. Uh, so far in this module, we've been talking about the ways in which anthropogenic climate change forcing will be resulting in changes to the atmosphere. And so far, we had been focusing on the temperature changes and the changes to the moisture content of the atmosphere, which were both, of course, increasing. And actually, from the last module of the course, that shouldn't be just hugely surprising when you think about that water vapor feedback in climate and so on. So in and of itself, that's not terribly shocking. Now, let's take a look exactly what we're talking about here, just kind of as a review. This is a different figure than the one that you had been looking at before in the previous lecture. But these five figures here, um, are, I'm going to be building a set of uh, figures that comes from the IPCC report here. This column of maps that you're seeing here are the average annual mean temperature difference between approximately now in the middle of the 21st century for four different ensembles of climate models. The top one are when the, all those models were being run using the RCP 2.6 or whatever the, the lowest forcing is, the one with the unrealistically small radiative forcing on the climate. And then each of the ones as you go farther down that column are for greater and greater amounts of anthropogenic climate forcing with the bottom one being that RCP 8.5, where there are 8.5 watts per square meter of radiative forcing due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases. And you don't see the whole key yet for the diagram, but I'm sure you're not terribly shocked to see that it's all in red, right? All of these plots are indicating that by the years, what do we have here, 2048, 2045 to 2065, something like that, the middle of the 21st century, all the models are indicating a warming climate, uh, regardless of what set of boundary conditions we're using, uh, which, are, which are these anthropogenic forcing scenarios we're using. And again, probably not hugely surprisingly, the one with the most temperature change is the one with the largest anthropogenic radiative forcing, the one at the bottom. So we are seeing the climate change, and you can see lots of your things that we have been learning about. Like, for example, you can see that the climate change is always greatest there, the Arctic and so on. Um, the like, climate change is greater over land than over the ocean. That's most easily seen on that bottom panel and so on. Now, that is only out to the middle of the 21st century. For what it's worth, actually, we can take this farther into the future, where this is from the year uh, 2180 to the year 20... I'm sorry, 2080 to 2100. So this is the last part of the 21st century. And you can see that the amount of warming is getting larger and larger. This isn't a temporary warming or something like that in the climate system, which exists as part of the natural variability of climate. This is a trend that continues over the remainder of the 21st century. Well... Just because we are gluttons for punishment, let's actually continue that all the way up to the end of the 22nd century. That's where that last column is. It's again the same four radiative forcings driven all the way out now to the year 2200. And you can see, okay, well, that top column, I'm sorry, that top row, which represents the unrealistically small anthropogenic forcings, well, I mean, the planet is still warmer, but it's not terribly warmer. But look at that bottom panel with that radiative forcing of 8.5 watts per square meter. My gosh, we have as much as like 9 to 11 degrees Celsius of climate change. Goodness gracious, that's what, about 18 degrees Fahrenheit of climate change? Uh, almost over the whole world by that time. Now, I'm not sure I buy necessarily that we would be able to make forecasts that far into the future of what climate change would be. But the idea of the trend is what's important here, okay? And the, clearly, this is not an, a, a passing phenomenon in the climate system. It is a permanent, it's a, at least on the order of centuries, permanent change. It's irreversible, but, but we talk about that. Now, all this stuff about these changes that we're expecting in the atmosphere due to climate change, changes in temperature, changes in moisture, changes in distribution of the storm track, all that kind of width of the tropical band, and so on, changes in distribution of precipitation and evaporation, and so on, all those changes in the, uh, in the atmosphere end up producing lots of other changes in the Earth, atmosphere, ocean system, 
It's a coupled system with lots of different components to it. And so we could be talking about changes to like ocean properties. Like for example, the, uh, oh, sorry, a window popped up here. The, uh, changes to the ocean properties like circulation patterns and temperature and acidity and so on. All of which could be very important on like climate time scales. If we change the major over the thermal haline circulation, if you know that term, the large scale circulation pattern, especially in the Atlantic, seems dependent on the climate of the Earth. And it, ultimately the climate of the Earth depends on that, that circulation pattern. We might be messing with that when we create anthropogenic climate change in the atmosphere. We might be talking about changes in the cryosphere, changes in the sea ice coverage or ice cap movements or glacial uh, extent and so on. We could be talking about changes in like land use and land cover and vegetation and so on and actually tons more. Okay, all these are important parts of the Earth atmosphere ocean system too. And all these things are kind of a challenge because the kinds of stuff I have on this list are not being predicted by those seven primitive equations that make up the numerical model of the climate that we are talking about. Those seven primitive equations are fundamental laws of how the atmosphere works, but they don't really have all that much to do with how a glacier moves or how a glacier grows or how soil moisture, how, how much vegetation is living on a, a piece of land. We have a problem here. I mean, some of these things are at least physics, okay? Changes in ocean properties like currents and sea surface temperatures and deep water temperatures and upwelling and salinity and so on, uh, distributions of nutrients in the ocean, all that stuff is at least physics. One could envision that we could use a type of numerical model, remember where numerical model uses the physics of the situation to make computational forecasts of the future, one could envision that there could at least be some kind of numerical model for stuff like that. I could envision that there could be a model of the cryosphere where like we literally keep track of the forces at work on some ice sheet or the processes that are maintaining the thickness of some sea ice and the thickness of the coverage or something like that. I can envision that such a thing probably exists. It does, but we'll get there. But it gets a whole lot more complicated actually when you talk about these biogeometeorology type things that I list down here where you're talking about like changes in land use and land coverage and so on. That's a complex interface between um, biology and ecology and soil management and agriculture and economics and sociology and it, it just goes on and on. This is not really something that is open for numerical modeling. That doesn't mean we can't make predictions about it, but like somehow writing a computer program that's going to predict how vegetation coverage changes over the next hundred years. I don't think there's going to be a computational way to do that. Um, okay, well let's let's think about the ones we might have a, a, a way of getting a toehold on, like like the oceanography stuff. Okay, let's talk about the oceans first. How could we numerically model what is going on in the ocean on climate time scales? I mean, I could take this here, this, this ocean here. And I could ask myself, what determines how the ocean is behaving? What processes, we talked about what processes drive the atmosphere on like climate time scales, like radiative forcing. For that matter, you're all survivors of the 113 class where you learned about the processes that drive weather on like hour by hour type sails, like, like the pressure gradient force, Coriolis force, and so on. What kind of processes are at work that drives the behavior of the oceans? Well, it turns out it's physics. It's a set of equations that describe like the forces acting on volumes of water and the thermodynamics of water and the processes that are about putting, adding and removing salt from the ocean and adding and removing the mass of water like through evaporation and so on, transport of sediments, things like that. Um, the currents that are in the ocean as they are being driven by wind stresses at the surface and density gradients at at constant depths of the ocean and so on. Oceanographers think they invented this stuff. Oceanographers, if you take an ocean mo ocean modeling class or something like that, they think they invented this stuff. Okay, atmospheric people think that we invented this stuff, they think they did. Whatever, the idea is solid. That it should be possible to come up with a numerical model of the ocean based on the ocean's primitive equations. 
Actually, I've taken classes in ocean modeling. I have to admit, I can't remember. Are there seven primitive equations in the ocean? Are there eight? I can't remember. Uh, but there's a system. That's the nature of a numerical model, is that they have a system of equations that predicts how they change in the future. Just like we have ones for climate in the atmosphere, we can make one for climate in the ocean. So it sounds like we should be able to do this. We should be able to make a numerical model of the ocean with its own set of primitive equations and, oh my gosh, it sounds like another whole nightmare of computing. It is. And then we're going to be describing how the ocean is going to be behaving. And the forcings that are going to be driving this ocean on the course of like a hundred year simulation or something like that are going to be things that are happening in the atmosphere. They're going to be things like the winds exerting stresses on the surface of the ocean that drive currents or fluxes of heat between the atmosphere and the ocean that transport heat out of the ocean into the atmosphere or out of the atmosphere into the ocean. Processes like evaporation and precipitation that add or remove mass from the ocean and add, more specifically, add or remove fresh water from the ocean. Um, this is all stuff that the atmospheric model that we're running for climate is already giving us. We have at the bottom of this atmospheric model we know what the winds are going to be at any given time. We know what the rainfall is going to be, the evaporation rate, and so on. So I can kind of envision what we could do here. I mean, if I could think about my little cheesy diagram that I've got going on here. See how we divided the atmosphere up into all those grid boxes? Remember, that was how numerical models worked. So we divided the system up into little pieces called grid boxes or grid points. Sometimes we envision them as being a point. Sometimes we envision them as being a box. But we did that for the whole world for these climate models. They had some resolution, usually on the order of a few tens of kilometers, something like that. And inside of that model, we used the seven primitive equations and the boundary conditions of future values of things like carbon dioxide and methane and so on to determine at any given time what, what we thought are a reasonable estimate of the winds, the pressure, the temperatures, the heat fluxes, the moisture fluxes, etc. at each of those boxes. It's something that is coming to us from these models that we're running. Okay? Well, what we really need to do, apparently, to understand the full atmosphere, ocean, earth system, is apparently divide the ocean up into a whole bunch of those little boxes, too, and make a numerical model of it. Now, I'm drawing it here as that, like, it has to be at the same resolution. It doesn't really have to be at the same resolution. I just copied and pasted the little grid that I made up there. In general, they're not at the same resolution, although they certainly could be. And then what we can do is take the information that we get from the atmospheric model at its lowest layer, where now we have some kind of known winds, known temperature, known heat flux, known flux of fresh water, you know, rainfall and evaporation, and so on. We know that. I mean, we know it in the sense of we spent a bunch of work computing it. And we could then use that to drive a forecast of what's going on in the ocean. We could use that information of, like, what's the wind at the surface and what kind of stress is it exerting on the surface of the ocean to create a force that's accelerating a current. We could forecast the currents. We could then use, like, the fluxes of long-wave radiation and short-wave radiation and temperature differences and so on to determine like sea surface temperatures or SSTs at the top of the ocean. We're forecasting that based on what the atmosphere should be doing at this point in the future. Or salinity. Salinity changes based on the rates of evaporation and uh, uh, precipitation on the ocean and so on. We could compute all that stuff and for that matter we could extend that down and keep making forecasts at layers of the ocean deeper. Just like we can make forecasts for all the different levels of the atmosphere, we can go down deeper and deeper in the ocean too. That's what a numerical model does. Oh, okay, so... That doesn't sound like the end of the world. It sounds like we let the atmospheric model run, and then we let the atmospheric model control what the ocean is doing. Because the ocean is controlled by winds and fluxes of heat and moisture from the atmosphere and so on. And that all sounds pretty good, but as I've drawn it so far, we have a problem. We've draw, driven, drawn it there as if the atmosphere drives the ocean. Like, the atmospheric model could run. We could do that first and then use the output of what's going on at the bottom layer of the model to drive our ocean model. And um, that, that, that is a strategy. That could be done. That would be a type of one-way interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. It just would be a lousy way. In the real world, changes in the atmosphere change the ocean, but changes in the ocean change the atmosphere. 
changes in like the especially the distribution of the temperature at the surface of the ocean radically change patterns of wind and precipitation and so on especially on very large scales like monsoons and things like that it's actually a complicated two-way interaction you can't just run the atmospheric model and then let the atmospheric model tell you what's going on in the ocean you have to run them together they have to be coupled okay think of coupled like uh, the way train cars get coupled together okay they are connected to each other one can't move without the other one moving Oh, okay. See, if I actually zoom in closer here, it's really a two-way interaction. It used to say known winds, known evaporation, known precipitation up there in the model, but now they're actually forecasted together. We actually let the atmosphere affect the ocean and let the ocean affect the atmosphere. That is called a coupled model. Okay? Coupled models allow two different system, two different features to work together as a system. And this thing in this case is one in which the atmosphere is, which the ocean and the atmosphere treated as a system. I like the verbiage that I used right there. Where changes in each drive changes in the other, which is a very, very realistic thing. That is how the real ocean atmosphere system works. There's no doubt about it. I mean, don't get me wrong. Find a paper sometime about ocean atmosphere interaction and you're going to bore yourself to sleep. But the truth is, that is how the real ocean atmosphere system works. Oceanographers look at their world, atmospheric scientists look at, at, their, at their world, forgetting that it's all really a system that's interacting and working together with complicated ideas about how waves interact with the ocean at different depths and how they interact with the interface between the ocean and the atmosphere and how atmospheric changes drive fluxes of water into and out of the ocean from rivers and discharge and from precipitation that falls directly onto the ocean and transport of sediments within the ocean and transport of salt from land onto the ocean. It's all a wildly complicated system. And it turns out that this is really hard. It turns out that this makes the whole business of simulating the atmosphere in the future, the way we're framing things so far in this course, makes that look easy. Taking two different systems that have their own rules and their own scales of motion and their own time scales and their own processes at work and trying to make them behave realistically as a system turns out to be vastly more difficult. I mean, if you just go to Google Scholar and do a search on coupled ocean atmosphere model, you'll find, uh, when I did this the other day, I got 1.3 million results. Okay, now remember, Google Scholar is going to be just pulling up uh, you know, web pages or something. These are like scientific papers, conference presentations, students' theses, things like that. Okay, they're actual, you know, scholarly publications. 1.3 million of them about just this relatively wonky term. Okay, this cup, the, the simple coupling strategy that I'm talking about where I just am saying, hey, let the atmospheric forcings at the bottom drive what's going on in the ocean, let what's going on in the ocean drive the atmosphere. I mean, you kind of get a concept of what I'm talking about here. It sounds pretty good, but in practice, the challenges in getting those feedbacks right is incredibly complicated. And in fact, it is really the main research topic right now in climate science in some ways. Um, so what should students in this class know about that? Well, first off, I would say that all of the models that you have looked at so far when you were reading the IPCC report and listening to my lectures and so on, all of them so far have been to one extent or another an example of a coupled model. That being said, all of these models are therefore trying to understand how the ocean and the atmosphere will respond together as a system as a response to the climate change that are being driven by human activity. But that doesn't mean that they're doing it all the same way. That's part of the good thing. That's part of why we have these IPCC reports is to help us look at across a spectrum of like 42 different models using lots of different strategies as to how to simulate this stuff. We're getting a sense of the range of possible outcomes and so on. This is pretty complicated stuff though and there is no single best solution as to how to best set up a coupled model. What I would tell you though is that all this business of two-way coupling where the ocean drives the atmosphere and the atmosphere drives the ocean is not always necessarily such a big problem. For example, let's think about numerical weather prediction, the actual business of making the forecast of what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. 
Okay, that uses exactly the same kind of set of seven primitive equations for our atmosphere as our climate model does. It's just that we're only running it out for 24 hours instead of for like 100 years. Yeah, maybe the resolution of the model is different. Maybe the domain of the model is different and so on. But the basic idea is the same. And if there's ocean in the domain of your model, you're going to want to have some kind of coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere. But what would that coupling be? Well, there's no doubt about it. The water temperature, the sea surface temperature, or SST, is going to matter. Sea surface temperatures at the surface of the ocean is one of the most important things about how the atmosphere and the ocean interact. If the water is warmer, there'll be more evaporation, there'll be more flux of heat from the ocean into the atmosphere, it can change the wind patterns. We're going to need to know that. The app, a simple model just trying to make a forecast of the weather 24 hours from now is going to need to be able to have a coupling between the ocean and the atmosphere to help drive short-term weather. But let's not go nuts here. Sure, those weather patterns are also going to ultimately help determine what the water temperature is and what the currents are and what, how much upwelling there is and all that kind of good oceanography stuff, but that'll take time. Okay, the changes in the ocean evolve relatively slowly so, frankly, by the time, say, weather patterns would result in a change to the sea surface temperature or a change to the uh, ocean currents at the surface of the ocean, well, frankly, long before that, the model's no good anyway because of initial condition problems in a, a numerical weather prediction model. So, we probably can get away with like a one-way coupling of the model where we let the ocean drive what's going on in the atmosphere and we don't worry so much about what the atmosphere is doing as it has to, in terms of how it changes what's going on in the ocean. Yes, over the course of the next couple weeks, that would result, those wind patterns would result in a change in the ocean currents, but the model's not any good out that far anyway, so the forecast is not good for a numerical weather prediction that far anyway. So like in that kind of application, we might be able to get away with a one-way coupling, just letting the ocean affect the atmosphere. There's a lot of these kinds of strategies to make this easier uh, in terms of uh, this kind of model simulation. All right, so we've talked about this ocean stuff. Before we move forward to other ways in which the atmosphere could be affected by, um, by, by other things we could be expecting about near-term climate change, let's answer a couple quick questions. Question one, day-to-day -day weather does not produce changes in the ocean currents or the distribution of sea surface temperatures. True or false? Oh. I'm not saying we don't, I'm, this isn't a question about modeling. I'm asking, does it actually produce changes? I make a choice between those two options and get a little feedback before we move on to question two.